All right, uh, can everyone see this? Yep. Cool. <clears throat> so, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm just gonna be talking about using a LSTM FCN combined neural network uh, to be used on data acquired from the LZ experiment. Um, so just a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. I'll give a, a very, very brief introduc introduction on the LZ experiment itself. Um, and then as the experiment is not yet running, I'll be using a simulated data set to train and test my network on. So go into depth a little bit about the actual data set. Um, and then I'll actually go into a little bit of a description on what an LSTM actually is and then how I apply it in my own network architecture. Uh, and then finally talk about the results of that application. Um, so the Lux Zeppelin, excuse me, the LZ experiment um, is a direct detection dark matter experiment uh, located a mile underground at the Sanford Underground Research Facility in Leeds, South Dakota. Um, LZ is a, a time, time projection chamber, uh, which allows for 3D reconstruction of events that occur within the detector. Uh, to do this, we make use of 494 photomultiplier tubes that are split up into two arrays that surround seven tons of liquid xenon. Uh, now, PMTs observe the light from particle interactions in that xenon, um, and then we read out that information to run analysis with. Uh, so um, when a particle interacts with liquid xenon, uh, it excites the xenon additives, which then de-excite and emit light. Uh, this is observed nearly immediately after a scatter. Um, this we call the S1 um, signal. Um, during some interaction, we also or a particle will also ionize electrons um, from the xenon atoms. And these electrons will drift upwards due to an electric field in the detector. And when the electrons then reach a gaseous phase of the gaseous xenon, um, the electrons will accelerate in that gas and emit a secondary signal of light that we call the S2 signal. Now, we can determine the three D or three dimensional um, uh, the three dimensional location of one of these events by looking at the um, the hit map of lights of the hit map of PMT signal, uh, which will tell us the X and Y location, um, as well as the the time between the S one and the S two signal. That will give us the 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 depth the Z coordinate of our event. Um, so this here is a, a raw waveform that we would acquire from PMTs. Um, this is an example of an S2. Um, it's fairly Gaussian in shape, um, but this pulse will be processed into a group of simplified pulse characteristics, such as the area or the height. Uh, we call these reduced quantities or RQs. Um, and most of the analysis that we perform to date is performed with these RQs as opposed to the waveforms themselves. Um, so um, the, it, a particular issue with this, um, with this detection method is that pulses or scatters that occur very closely in time or in space, uh, the pulses themselves will overlap. And rare events, rare types of interactions um, being, being able to identify these rare interactions or these rare events uh, requires determining whether or not these pulses are single scatters or double scatters. Um, so we, we need to be able to do that. Now, normally that is done with these RQs, but when we convert these raw waveforms into these high level features, we lose some amount of information in that process. Um, so the idea here 
is to ask whether or not we can improve classification accuracy um, in determining single or double scatters by using an architecture that is specifically designed for time series classification. Um, so to talk a bit about the data set that I'll be using to test this, um, I've generated a, a group of um, single or double pulses uh, generated from a large distribution of pulse characteristics such as width, amplitude, the separation of pulses. Um, double pulses are generated by co-adding two identical Gaussians, and these are separated by some random sample number. Now, I've, I've generated this data set such that the distributions of the single and the double pulses are overlapping as much as possible uh, to prevent the network from cheating and learning some specific attribute of the data set that allows for easy characterization of the pulses. Um, so these, this table just shows the distributions that I pulled these quantities from. Um, that's not particularly important um, for you, at least right now. And some important thing to note, though, is that what I am calling here the effective width, that is the number of samples above some threshold value. Uh, that is different than what is called the drift width. The drift width is a, a characteristic width of our S2 pulses that is known based off of the distance between the S1 and the S2 pulses. Um, after electrons are ionized in some interactions, the electron cloud will diffuse as it drifts upward in the detector. We know, we have a very good idea of how much diffusion to expect based off of how long the electrons were drifting. So that drift width would be the sigma or the full width half max of the, of the um, simulated Gaussians that is different than the effective width of how many samples are above some threshold value. Uh, this becomes important later, so I, I mentioned it here. Um, I think I heard something. Is there a question? Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So can you just comment on like the physical significance of a single versus a double pulse? Yeah, so um, different types of particle interactions will produce different types of event topologies. And so a, a very simple, simple example is that dark matter itself, we know that the interaction probability is so low that we'd expect a single scatter um, when looking at these events. So if you can say that something has scattered twice, you know that that is not a WIMP scatter um, because the probability of that is so minute. So we need to be able to say, oh, this particular event is a double scatter, this particular event is a single scatter. Um, now, what I'm particularly hoping to apply this to is other events such as double electron capture, which can be, we know has a characteristic, would show a characteristic double scatter in an event, um, but the of energy of that event is very similar to just a single um, gamma scatter in an event or in the detector. And so if we can um, classify single versus double, you have the ability to look for these more rare events where that is a key factor um, in determining the two. Gotcha, thanks. Yep. Um, so yeah, here, here's what my actual data set looks like. Uh, so you have a, a large variety of pulses. Some of these are single pulses, some of these are double, um, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Now, some of these are very obviously double pulses. Um, so those being a network being able to classify this as a double pulse is not particularly interesting. But a network that can classify pulses or double pulses where the separation is less than the width of the pulses, um, becomes much more useful. So yes, this, these two are obviously double pulses, but this one is also a double pulse. And so the idea here is to create a network that is robust enough to be able to classify all these types of, um, all these forms that a, a pulse, a double pulse may take. <clears throat> so the way that I do that is using an LSTM. Now, an LSTM, 
is a long short term memory unit. <coughs> um, a long short term memory unit, which is a, a recurrent neural network uh, that specializes in sequence analysis. Um, so you'll often see these things being used anytime, um, anytime sequence analysis is required. So natural language processing, they're used all the time. Weather forecasting, they do a good job at predicting time series. Um, so people try to apply them to things like predicting the stock market. Um, doesn't always work very well. Doesn't work very well, but it's the sort of network that you would use in those situations. Um, so the, the meat of an LSTM comes in to something called the cell state. Um, it is a hidden vector that stores information um, about each successive input and uses it at each next output or to, to create the next output. So you have some input value at the timestamp t minus one that goes into a cell state that is passed through to create the output for some input at time t. Um, so um, if for a univariate time series, which is what we have with these pulses, um, the state vector and the output at each previous timestamp is used to generate the output at the next timestamp. Um, so more about what actually is going on inside one of these cells. Um, each LSTM cell has three gated functions, which are essentially fully connected layers that have these two that are, that have, um, these particular activation functions applied to them and then formulated in a specific way. And so these, these three gates are, the first one is known as the forget gate. The forget gate determines what information from the cell state should be used at this time step. Uh, so it would be the value going in here, um, or the final value would be something between zero and one that's either says that we're going to use some value in the cell state or we're not going to use it. Um, the input gate does a very similar thing, which says that either, or that determines what part of the input will be used for the, um, will be used to apply to the cell state to continue through to the next cell. Um, and then finally, you have the output gate which determines what part of the cell state and the input are used for the output. Um, so it, it's a very complicated series, but essentially all of these um, values are just fully connected layers that are connected in a, a intricate way. Um, so what is the LSTM FCN? That's the type of network structure that I'm using. Um, the FCN stands for fully convolutional network. Um, it's a type of, of convolutional neural network of CNN, um, but replaces the final feed forward layer that you might see usually uh, with a global pooling layer. And what that does is it takes the maximum or the average value, whether or not you're using the global max pooling or global average pooling, it takes that single value from the feature map um, of the previous convolutional layers. Uh, this works as a feature extractor and the most useful attribute is that it allows for variable input lengths into the network. Um, so that's the FCN, but then the LSTM is actually preceded by something called that something we call the dimensional shuffle. This essentially just transposes the input vector. Um, it changes it from a univariate time series of n samples and changes that into an n variable multivariate time series of a single sample. What that essentially means, the consequence of that for the LSTM is that you essentially cut out the cell state. You now only have a single input and you have a single output. Uh, those can be vectors, but you're no longer having this. Um, it's no longer treating your input as a time series. It's just treating it as a single input vector. Um, so essentially, 
So you cut out the cell state and all that is remaining is a more complicated feed forward network. Um, it's still gated by the sigmoid and tanch activation functions um, where the Ws here are trainable weights and Bs are trainable biases. Um, but you, you no longer have an additional cell state which is contributing to this output. Uh, that simplifies it quite a bit, uh, but I still think it's important to know how the LSTM works fundamentally before you apply it like this. Um, so the actual network that I'm using for this, I use a fairly simple LSTM. Um, it's a single layer with 10 units. Uh, 10 units means that each feed forward network um, had 10 nodes, and then the output of this LSTM is a vector of length 10. Um, and then I use a, a, a very simplified fully convolutional network. I use only a single convolutional layer with a single filter. Um, that filter is fairly wide. So there's 150 samples in that single filter. This is enough to be able to see the entire pulse in a single application of the filter. Um, but it also allows for improved interpretability into what the network is looking for. Um, it's easier to say what a single filter is look looking at than a single large filter than many, many small filters. Um, and then I use global max pooling to take out the maximum value of this feature map. These values are all concatenated together and then run it into a sigmoid activation function, which is used for binary classification. So the output, the single value of this, if it's closer to a zero, we say that's a single pulse. <clears throat> if it's closer to a one, we say that's a double pulse. Now, this works fairly well, but we can actually use additional information to improve the accuracy of the network. Um, so the idea behind this is that we don't wanna throw away any information at all. We want to use all of the information that we can accumulate by taking data um, to make the, the highest accuracy network possible. So this goes back to something that I mentioned previously, the drift width. This is a, a physics-based width of a expected width of a pulse that is defined clearly by the amount of time that the electrons drift through the liquid xenon. Um, as I said before, as you have this cloud of electrons drifting upwards, they diffuse outwards, which increases the width of the S2 pulse. We know this value based off of the um, time between the S1 and the S2 pulse. So we can actually use this information in making a classification as well. So here is the final vector that is passed into the, the sigmoid activation function. You have the single output from the fully convolutional layer. You have the 10 outputs from the LSTM layer, and you have a single out or single value that is corresponding to the drift width. Um, this is just concatenated to the end. Now, I found that what you're essentially doing here is adding and subtracting all these values together to get some final value at the end here. Um, each of these will have some weight associated with it that tells whether or not you're adding or subtracting to get a single value. Um, that doesn't necessarily work the best. So what I've done is apply a intermediate feed forward layer, which more intelligently, or I should say, allows the network to learn the best way to combine this information together. So there, this intermediate layer combines the, inf the concatenated information here into a single value, which then is used for classification. So after all that, that's the final structure of the network. We can look at results. Um, here is a plot that shows the distribution of, out of network outputs for a 20,000 validation data set. Um, what I'm showing here is the sigmoid output. So anything closer to one is classified as a double pulse. Anything closer to zero is classified as a single pulse. And just from this, you can see that the accuracy is very high. We actually get a 98% accuracy um, in classification, 
where 97% of the double events, double scatters, are classified correctly, and 100% of the single scatters are classified correctly. So the network is very good at finding single scatters and mostly good at classifying doubles. Now, I mentioned that I added in this additional drift width term. So I just wanted to compare the results with and without this additional drift width term. This is an ROC curve, which plots the true positive rate against the false positive rate. And what you're looking for with a network is that this line should be as close to a right angle as possible. That means the network is at 100% accuracy when it's a perfect right angle. And as you can see, it's with drift width, is it is very close to that right angle. We are there. There is a 10% increase in accuracy with this additional term. So the idea behind adding in all the information you know into a network is useful because essentially the network, the network would probably learn this drift width in, um, information as it was training. But by providing it as an additional piece of information, the network no longer has to work to learn that information and can st instead focus on different pieces of information for pulses. Um, so we do want to break down this network structure and try to learn what the different pieces are doing and how they're performing, not just how well they're performing. Um, and so we can do that very well with the convolutional layer. Um, as I said, there's only a single value. It has 150 trainable weights. Um, and the way that this filter, um, this is the final form of the trained filter. When this is applied or convolved with some input pulse, which is shown here in blue, you get the feature map um, in orange here. And the global max pooling layer will take the maximum value of this feature map and send that into classification to be used for classification. Um, so because we know that it's just the single value, we can look at what, what is the filter seeing at this one point. Um, and this is where the filter is located at that point. And so what it's doing, um, we can say that the filter is, is looking at a linear combination between the peak of the filter and the rising and falling edge. So just by using this single filter and this global max pooling layer, we can kind of look at the same information that the network is using to make some kind of distinction or some kind of classification. Now, this is much harder to do with the LSTM layer. And I think with any application of machine learning to a physics problem, you have to be able to interpret the results. And that is honestly the biggest issue with this network architecture is that half of it is this black box that needs further digging to really understand. Um, so that's kind of the direction going forward. Um, I did just want to go over the performance of this network. Um, you can see that, or what I'm plotting here is the distributions of the correctly and incorrectly classified pulses based off of those um, pulse characteristics that I use to generate the data set. So, we have in blue, we have all the single pulses. Um, in orange, we have all the double pulses. And then in green here, we have all the misclassified double pulses. Uh, remember, there are no misclassified single pulses for this network. Um, but what you end up seeing here is you see two very distinct distributions of misclassified double pulses. Now, they all occur at low separation. That makes sense because as these pulses overlap, it's going to be harder and harder to say whether that they're a single pulse or that they are a double pulse. They look more and more like a single pulse as that separation decreases. Um, but it's important to ask why are these two distributions um, showing themselves here? And it's unclear at the moment if that is an issue with the simulation. Um, is there some giveaway that is or it, is there something that is incorrectly simulated with these pulses that is making it particularly hard for these regions to be classified? Um, 
or is that just giving us more information about how is the network is performing? Uh, that needs to be investigated further. Um, so finally, to ask how well a network is performing, yes, you can look at these ROC curves or you can look at the sigmoid output histograms, but we need to compare it to some baseline non-machine learning technique that can say, oh, this is performing better than what we could do um, without machine learning. So I've just taken a very simple example that I have looked at the area cumulative distribution functions, and I've looked at the distance um, between points, certain pulse area fractions, um, and tried to use those values to differentiate pulse type. So we look at the distance between 5, 10%, 25%, 50%, so on of the area and make the assumption that these, um, these values should differ based off of whether or not you have a single or double pulse. Now you have these six or so different quantities. You want to make a, a cut, a good method of Doing so is using principal component analysis. This reduces those six dimensions into a two-dimensional, um, two axes, uh, which then we can make a single cut uh, that classifies single versus double pulses. And that's what I'm showing here. Here in orange are all the double pulses in this new parameter space. And these blue dots are all the single pulses in this parameter space. We can make a cut that maximizes the classification accuracy, and it does pretty well. Um, there's 75 or 77 percent accuracy with this method, but even so, that does not stand well to the nearly 100 percent accuracy of the machine learning technique. So there is certainly an improvement with this method, um, but it would be more interesting to understand a little bit more about the why the network is performing that well. Um, so to conclude, um, LSTMs and FCNs particularly combined together um, are extremely powerful in classifying time series data. Uh, I have achieved a high accuracy in differentiating simulated single and double pulses. Um, and I have shown an improvement over a non-machine learning technique. Whether or not that is the best is not not the case. That is likely not the best method of doing so. Um, so I, th I think going forward, comparing to the the best method is is important to do. Um, additionally, as I have said, we need to improve the interpretability of the LSTM side of this network. Um, right now, it's a black box. We would like it not to be. Um, and finally, I, th I think this data set is just too easy. Um, yes, these Gaussians and these combined Gaussians are indicative of the sorts of the real sorts of data that we would see in LZ. Um, but it's, it, I, I think a near 100% accuracy is not something that we should expect. Um, so it'd be important to run these same sorts of trials on real data once we have real data coming in with uh, or um, the better simulated S2s. Um, but that is it for now. Thank you very much. And does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, yeah. Um, so in your performance thing, so slide 17, do you have any, I think it was slide 17. This guy? Um, yeah, so green is um, the ones that are uh, misclassified, right? Yeah, correct. Um, do you have any idea why for the height it's bimodal? That's confusing me. Yeah, so that's <clears throat> these like two clear distributions. Yeah, are... that, I can't make sense of that. Like, so I think I think you can explain one fairly well, easily. Is so if you look at this right distribution, these are uh, the large height pulses, double pulses. Those, if you, you can kind of see it here that there are more single pulses of that um, with that characteristic than there are double pulses. So the, the distribution of double pulses with large height is um, less dense. And so I think the network 
it uh, struggles with those pulses. So it's easier to, it's more likely to get it correct if it just guesses single pulses at that point. So it's, um, it's sort of a function of your simulation to a degree. Uh, yes. And, and so it, I, I've tried to iron that out as much as possible yeah. by overlapping these, um, these, dist these like parameter, parameter distributions as much as possible. Um, but that's, you can't get 100% overlap when you're adding Gaussians together like this. And so there's bound to be some of that at the tail edges of these distributions. So I think that explains this right-hand distribution. This left one? I would almost expect that to be at like the boundary. I, I know this isn't like a posterior or anything, but I mean, it should be, you know. Um... Mm -hmm. I, I think there's noise being applied to these pulses. So that might have something to do with some signal to noise ratio on that left-hand side um, where the noise is just starting to look like there are pulses where the noise just happens to look like a second pulse. Um, but I, I think that's a guess and something that I'd like to further dig into as to why, if that's, if there's a reason that that is just giving away this, the results. And when you say height here, do you mean height of the total? So for like the case of the double pulse, that's the height of the combined, yes. like the, the yep. highest. Okay. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. So all of these, okay. um, these height area effective widths, they are of the combined pulse. Um, so what I've actually done to generate single pulses is it's, it's just two of the identical Gaussians added together and the doubles are just two identical Gaussians added together at some distance with some randomized separation. Um, so the generation of each of these types of pulses is identical. Um, but yeah, I, I think those cases are curious and important to dig out. I had a question just to like clarify, but I think um, for your inputs into your um, your LSTM network, mm -hmm. I think you said you had this like uh, comparison of two rock curves where you added the uh, yeah yep, yep. yeah what was it that you added the I think it was like the so effective width added, the drift oh I, the drift width right yeah yep so I, I guess I was a little confused in terms of like the what are all of the inputs you're adding because I thought it was a time series you're putting in but then you're adding yeah. two other values so, too or that is. It is a time series. So the input itself here is just a pulse. It's the time series pulses. It's these guys, one of them. Um, that's the input at the beginning of the network. But then I'm additionally concatenating at this stage of the network, I'm concatenating that drift width value to oh, okay, I see. this vector here. Um, so yeah, that's not shown in this architecture. Okay, but that, um, that's not that's not inherently part of the the framework of the LSTM and the I see that's just something that you added. No, yeah, that's okay, just okay, the okay, gotcha. quantity that we would know if we were looking if we looked at some specific event, we could pull out the expected width of the pulse um, because that is a clearly defined number based off of the distance between the S1 and the S2. We know that these pulses will be, or this electron cloud will diffuse X amount because it has drift, it has drifted Y. Mm -hmm. you know, so so I, I guess I guess my question to kind of like see if I understand this correctly is effectively like you, you could have, if you didn't have that additional drift width added there, you could say that you, you could treat the discriminator output of the sigma, or like the, I guess the last layer, right? The output of this um, network mm -hmm. as its own like collection of variables. And then you could train a, an ent entirely independent network with that as an input, along with your uh, drift width and your effective width and all that. And then, yeah. So, but then you're just combining all into one package basically. For, like, that's essentially, yeah. Things. That's okay, essentially okay. what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm combining, I have the information from the LSTM, the information from the FCN, and then I have a, a whole separate network that combines those outputs with the width 
into a final single value. Okay, that, that makes sense because because we actually do something pretty similar in um, en high energy experiment with a lot. We have a lot of different like taggers for jets and whatnot, mm -hmm. and so we use those as inputs to other neural networks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have all this information, right? You don't want to throw. You can make the best classification possible if you use all the information that you give or have been given. Um, right. So long as you're not just. I think there will be a certain amount of. You don't want to just throw everything onto the wall and see what sticks, but there's certain bits of information that is obviously useful, and this drift width is one of those bits of information. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question for you. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, I, since, since I'm not super familiar with, I don't know, maybe the output of Lux or what you expect the output of LZ to look like, will, how easily will you be able to isolate single pulses? Or like if you're putting in a, a pulse time series, like will it be mm -hmm. the case that you'll always have some nice single or double pulse peak and then clean floor around it? So what we do in our, when we're acquiring data, we do something called pulse only digitization. So it essentially, we record the timestamp of every sample that we record, as well as when um, it, when the, um, when some value exceeds a threshold. So what you're left with, and all of those are just placed onto some time series, some zero baseline time series. So you're left with something that looks like it's a little small, but it's zero around the pulse and then non-zero at the pulse. So the, the acquisition method itself is very good at discriminating between baseline and actual signal. Um, so you're left with just, it's easy enough to extract a single pulse um, to get something that would just look like this to be able to throw into a network. Now, granted, there's a lot of noise that sometimes noise passes through that classification method. Um, and you would not want to just throw noise into this, but um, it's not impossible to extract pulses by themselves like this. I think that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. And I guess I was also just wondering, like, would it I don't know what the event rates are like for scattering events detected by the PMTs, but would it be possible for two double pulses to overlap within the same time series or something of that nature, like a double pulse and a single pulse? Yes, the, I, the rates are low enough to where that's not the, like, there are a reasonable amount of When we see a double or single pulse, it is likely going to be happening from the same particle. So a single particle scattering multiple times as opposed to multiple scar particles scattering at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so those, a single pulse or a single particle can scatter many times very quickly in the detector. Um, and that's when you want to be able to discriminate the single double pulses. But it's not very common that you'd see multiple particles scattering at the same time and then those signals co-adding. Um, gotcha. But then also when you have very fast particles, uh, the pulses can scatter or the, the scattered particles travel a great distance between scatters. And so you can resolve them in X and Y, even if you can't necessarily resolve them in Z. Um, so for these true multi-scatters that are hard to resolve, to for those to occur, you need a single particle that is scattering very quickly, very close together in time, in space and in time. Gotcha. Um, but that still happens, and that's something that we need to be able to address. Cool. Thanks.
Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, well, unless there's any other questions, I will uh, say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. See you later. Appreciate it. And um, I think we'll have another talk next week from a guy from NYU. So that will be exciting. Okay. Stop by. Yeah, there is also um, someone from the collaboration I work with, Paula Plant, is giving a talk tomorrow for the CFPU talk. Oh, series. is he? Okay. Yeah, and it's it should is that be tomorrow. I think. Yeah, it's tomorrow. Yeah, that's on okay. Email. But it's that will at least part of that I'm sure will be machine learning based for anyone cool. interested for machine learning yeah. technology applications. That's good to know. Thanks for pointing that out. See you. All right. Thanks, Austin. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks.